Hello, my name is John Deben. I'm one of the uh, genealogy specialists at the National Archives and Records Administration. And this lecture we're going to talk about uh, how to research military service. Um, I'm focusing specifically on, in this lecture on volunteer service in the U.S. military. Um, there are different types of, of service that were documented in different ways. Uh, volunteer service, of course, uh, encompassed the, uh, the state regiments and local militia that were raised for specific wars or national emergencies. Uh, the regiments were recruited, the men fought and, and served, and then at the end of the wars, uh, the regiments were disbanded and the men went home, and that was the extent of their service. Um, because of that, the, the War Department never had any official documents, per se, to, to record uh, the history of their service. So, in the 1890s, they decided to create these compiled military service records, and these are the, the basic records that we have to document volunteer service in the U.S. military. Um, they started to do it originally for Union veterans to document their service in terms of uh, verifying their service for pension benefits. Um, and then afterwards, they went back and they documented um, volunteer so uh, soldiers for other wars as well, going back to the Revolutionary War. So the, the records that we have, there were um, extracted information from original records that were kept at the time of the, that these wars took place, including muster rolls, payrolls, uh, unit returns, hospital records, uh, prison records, and things of that nature. And they went through these records and they had employed probably thousands of War Department clerks to extract specific information about individual soldiers from these records. They, they copied the information down on individual cards and those cards became that soldier's compiled service record. So this, the compiled records that we now have are arranged by war, then by state, then by unit, and then alphabetically by the soldier's name. And we have compiled service records then going back from the Revolutionary War um, in 1775 all the way up to the early 20th century with the Philippine insurrection which ended in 1902. So we have for the Revolutionary War, we have compiled service records for uh, the post-revolutionary period from 1784 to 1811, which included a lot of militias that were raised uh, to protect uh, the frontiers against Indian, um, Indian warfare. The War of 1812, uh, other antebellum Indian wars from the First Seminole War to the Third, Sem uh, the Third Seminole War, which ended in 1858. Um, the Mexican War, the Civil War, Spanish-American War, and the Philippine Insurrection. Um, all of those records, uh, the compiled service records, are available in textual form uh, with a few exceptions. For the Revolutionary War, for the post-revolutionary period, and for selected records from the Civil War are available on microfilm. Uh, for the Civil War specifically, what we have available uh, on film for compiled service records are the Confederate records. Um, and on the Union side, we have um, selected records for the border states, western states and territories, and southern states that supplied Union regiments during the war itself. But your major northern states, Pennsylvania, New York, Michigan, Minnesota, and so on, those records are still only available in textual form. So what basic information can you find in a compiled service record for a volunteer soldier? It will give his full name, um, his dates of enlistment, or when he was mustered into service, and also his dates of discharge, or when he was mustered out. Um, sometimes it'll give you his period of service, if you enlisted for a three-year term, or a two-year, or nine-month term, and so forth. Um, it usually gives his, his residence, not necessarily the place where he was born, but where he was residing at the time that he enlisted. Some personal information, sometimes you'll get a personal uh, a description, um, height, weight, eye, eye and hair color, and, and so forth. And then they'll, they'll also have uh, notations regarding specific activities or um, events of notice that took place during his service, if he was assigned to special duty for something. Um, if he was uh, captured and, s and served time in a prisoner of war camp, or if he was in a hospital, wounded, and, and things of that nature. That'll be noted on the uh, service record cards as well. So we'll take a, a look at a, at a specific example of a service record, looking at William Graham, who served in the 1st Massachusetts Regiment during the Revolutionary War. Um, if you look at the first uh, image from that uh, service record, this is actually a, an image of the jacket that the rec record is um, contained in. And it gives you the basic information right on the jacket about the soldier, including his name, his unit, the war he served, and it will also provide um, the rank that he held when he went into service and the rank that he held when he was discharged from service. There are also a series of card numbers that are arranged on the front of the jacket. Um, generally, what these cards, what these numbers refer to, each number is stamped on the back of one of the cards that are inside the jacket. So basically, this was 
a basic record keeping technique that was used by the War Department to make sure that the right cards were filed with the right jacket. So they don't lead necessarily to any other specific records. However, if you look at the bottom of the jacket where it says bookmark, if you see information recorded there, numbers or any other notations, those could lead you to other textual records that we might have in our holdings. So it would be definitely take a, uh, be worthwhile to take a look at that. If we look at some of the uh, cards inside the jacket, um, you'll find other sp more specific information about the soldier. Um, the first card in this slide shows uh, more specific information about the company that he served in. In this case, it shows the name of his company commander, Captain Abraham Hunt, and it also shows his regimental commander, uh, Colonel Joseph Voge. So that's more specific information that we didn't have from the front of the jacket. Sometimes you also notice um, variations in the spelling of the last names. Um, here you'll see his last name spelled G-R-A-Y-H-A-M, as well as the traditional Graham, G-R-A-H-A-M. Um, you have to remember that when these original records were recorded, that at the time, uh, all the information was transmitted verbally. So there were going to be spelling variations, so you just need to be aware of that. Um, the cards also show his date of, en of enlistment, January 26, 1776. And you also notice uh, between two of the cards, there's a change in rank. In January of 1778, he's still holding the rank of corporal, which he went into the service with. Um, but in May of 1779, he's a private. We don't know why. The records don't indicate on the cards. But something happened uh, at some point in time um, that he was broken in rank from corporal to private. But as we saw on the jacket, on the outside of the jacket, he ended his service as a corporal. So whatever happened, he must have redeemed himself and re he regained his original rank. But of course, the records don't specifically indicate what might have happened. So just to summarize then, the basic information that you can find in the compiled service record, we have the, uh, the soldier's name, William Graham. Uh, we learned that he served in Captain Abraham Hunt's company of, of Colonel Joseph Voge's 1st Massachusetts Regiment. Um, it was also known sometimes, it's also recorded in the compiled service record as the 1st Massachusetts Battalion of Forces. Um, he listed January 26, 1776 for three years. Um, holding the rank of corporal, then demoted to private, but ending his service as a corporal again. And it also shows that um, the various pay rates that he received during his time of service. For example, when he was serving as a corporal in January of 1778, he was being paid seven and a third dollars per month for that service. Um, when he was serving those few months as a, as a private, he received six and two third dollars per month uh, for that service. Where you can generally find the records, um, of course, all the textual records are available here at the National Archives building. Um, the records that are available on microfilm and also online, you can also find um, on Footnote, Ancestry, or Heritage Quest online. Um, and you can also, um, if you can't visit the National Archives in person, you can request the records um, through the mail using a traditional uh, mail-in form that is, that's also available to download from our website, www.archives.gov.